So we're now on the, into the fifth part of the course called What is to be done? Um, and I want to just begin by talking about the key features of the politics of insecurity, uh, some of which we addressed earlier in the course and some in the last two lectures. But they really shape the landscape on which we have to think about uh, what can and cannot be done in politics in the world is, as we actually find it. And so first thinking about um, voters, um, one thing that we have learned is that uh, local inequalities matter to people much more than global inequalities. Bernie Sanders can uh, talk as much as he likes about the top 1% and it will motivate activists on the left of the Democratic Party, but most voters really care about much more local inequalities. And we talked about this earlier in the course when we were talking about how the capuchin monkey experiment was misinterpreted when, when the, uh, the angry monkey was likened to the Wall Street protester, but rather the monkey was angry because uh, she or he was not getting something that a similarly situated monkey was getting. It was, the monkey was not troubled that the, that the researcher had a big bowl of grapes and, uh, grapes and cucumbers. So people tend to compare themselves to similarly situated others. Um, oil workers might compare themselves to coal miners. Uh, auto workers might compare themselves to steel workers, and this is true up and down the occupational scale. I think I mentioned to you a professor would be much more troubled to learn that she or he is paid significantly uh, less, say $10,000 less than a professor in the next office, than to learn they're paid half a million dollars less than the attorney next door. So people tend to make local comparisons, and the, uh, the idea that Marx hoped for, that people would start to make more global comparisons, is not supported by the research uh, of sociologists and social psychologists. Secondly, uh, think about um, Rick Santelli's rant, another illustration of this point. This is the famous rant on the Chicago Mercantile uh, Exchange when, right after the Obama administration came into office and had started talking about minor mortgage relief for homeowners. Nothing like John Gina Coppola was proposing, but nonetheless he was proposing uh, reducing interest rates at least for a time on people's loans. And it produced a lot of rage uh, that was articulated in that, uh, in that video I showed you. Uh, with the, at the end of it, he's calling for a Tea Party, and people credit the t formation of the Tea Party um, with, uh, as, as being, if you like, catalyzed by Rick Santelli's rant on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And you might also recall that one of the things he complained about was he said it's a moral hazard, it's a moral hazard. Um, but notice, of course, bailing out the banks is also a moral hazard, right? Bailing out the banks is giving banks an incentive to gamble with taxpayers' money. So while it may be a moral hazard, to bail out the homeowners, it's no less, you might say in some ways, it's a more consequential moral hazard to bail out the banks. Nonetheless, what enraged him was that, uh, do you want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage, he rhetorically said. So it's, again, local comparisons that matter to people. Um, think about the difference between the Trump and Sanders campaigns on uh, this question of uh, who people compare themselves with. Uh, in many ways, Trump and Sanders ran uh, populist campaigns in the 2016 election. They attacked Wall Street elites they, uh, for being corrupt, um, but, the, but a difference was that uh, Sanders talked a lot about inequality, uh, whereas Trump did not. Trump never promised to reduce inequality. He never, as I said, even uh, said what Ronald Reagan had said, that he wants America to be a country in which everybody can get rich. Um, 
All he said was that you people have been screwed. You people have been um, uh, left behind by the, uh, by the policies of foolish elites. He called everybody idiots, and I'm going I'm to put America first, and so on. And to the extent there was a fairness argument, we talked about this in connection with Arlie Hochschild's narrative of cutting in. Some people have cut in front of me and taken something that I would otherwise have gotten. Right? Again, very local comparisons that people are making. They are not thinking about what people uh, very distant from them in the socioeconomic order are making. Um, related to that, closely related to that, is the loss aversion and in its insecurity often matter much more to people than in equality. Again, think here of Trump's Make America Great Again. Uh, something's been taken away from you. We're going to do bring it back and, and do something. Uh, we're going to recreate something that had existed before. I am going to bring back those jobs. I'm not going to make you rich. I'm going to bring back those jobs. Uh, that was the essence of his campaign, whereas Hillary's was she took that other Reagan line, Americans' best days are ahead, uh, sunny optimism, which uh, was, is a lot harder to sustain during an era of endemic employment insecurity. And again, just driving home the point that it's insecurity and the fear of downward mobility that matters much more to people than their place in the distribution of income and wealth uh, globally conceived. Remember those data about Trump primary voters, only a third of whom earn lower than the median income, below $50,000 uh, a head uh, per family. Uh, another, the uh, second third earn between the median income and $100,000, and the third third of primary voters, not uh, Republican voters in the general election, were Trump supporters and in, in those uh, primaries. So again, uh, middle class people who feel insecure, and this is um, uh, what Dan Markovitz's book is about, may be just as anxious and, and mobilizable uh, by a populist politician as poor people who feel insecure. Um, so that the, the, the insecurity and loss of aversion matter more than inequality, and it's local inequalities that matter much more to people uh, than global ones. And then we're living in a world in which almost everywhere organized labor is weaker than it's been in decades. We've seen in country after country the decline of union movements. It's way down in this, into single digits in the U.S. and the and uh, the majority of workers that are organized now are in public sector unions, which do uh, have some political clout. We will see next week when we talk about education. But for the most part, as a force in politics, unions um, have, have seldom been as weak, uh, if ever, uh, in the last 80 or 90 years, uh, if ever, uh, as, than they are, uh, as they are uh, today. Uh, this is particularly pronounced in the U.S., but we saw in pretty much everywhere except one or pla two places like Finland and Iceland, we've seen a decline in the power of organized labor. Concomitant to that, um, business interests are stronger than they've been uh, for decades, uh, partly because of the collapse of a serious alternative out there, um, communism, to the extent it exists politically, is now supported by capitalist economies um, in places like China and Vietnam. And so there's no real alternative to capitalism out there, which obviously greatly increases the power of capital, particularly in an era of globalization when it can easily flee. Um, the flying geese theory that Christina talked about in the China lecture. Uh, and in these, as, as jobs go on increasingly to technology, capital doesn't even need to flee. 
in order to uh, increase its leverage over labor. So we're living in a world in which labor is weaker than it's uh, been in living memory, and business interests are more powerful than they've been in living memory. And then coming to the Thursday's lecture uh, of last week, we're also living in a world in which political parties have become weaker and more fragmented uh, just about everywhere. Uh, and this is a, not something that has gone on for eight decades, but it certainly has gone on over the past four decades as labor has become weaker, parties on the left have fragmented, and we saw that as induced fragmentation on the right uh, in multi-party systems. And all over the democratic world, this impulse to uh, democratize parties, to get more and more direct democracy in the governance of parties and in making of decisions has greatly weakened parties in both multi-party systems and even two-party systems and indeed even the, the, uh, the platonic form of what used to be uh, two-party systems, the Westminster system between their uh, going for um, referenda, between the changes in their leadership selection rules, between adopting things like fixed parliaments and uh, candidate selection also being decentralized. They have replicated much of the rest of the democratic world in uh, making it much more difficult for parties to present, uh, get elected on programmatic platforms, and then implement them as governments. Um, it's a world that's ripe for populist charlatans who exploit insecurity and promise snake oil solutions. Um, so, um, what is to be done? Now, at the beginning of the course, when I, I um, prefaced some of these themes um, in the first few lectures, I also said, don't get too depressed. <laughs> uh, and in many, in many respects, this is a, is a depressing prospect. But what I want to be arguing uh, in these last lectures is that uh, certainly we shouldn't give up hope and that there are ways of thinking constructively about politics going forward. Uh, and indeed, in some respects, there are reasons not just for hope but even some optimism. This was a distinction Martin Luther King made towards the end of his life. He said he was no longer optimistic but he hadn't given up hope. Um, I think we, there are some reasons to think that it might be possible to come up with constructive change and build the requisite support uh, for it to happen. And so that's where we're headed in these final lectures. So a central message uh, of this final part of the course and a, 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 if you like presupposition of much that I'm going to say to you paraphrasing Immanuel Kant, is that policy without politics is empty, but politics without policy is blind. Um, policy, politics without policy is empty, and politics without policy is blind. So let me emphasize that it's not just in the real world, uh, but in the academic literature, for the most part, people who study policy don't think very much about politics. They think about what policies would be good, what should happen, but they have relatively little to say about how they're going to get it to happen. Um, whereas people who study politics tend to explain why what happens happens, but have very little to say about what should happen. And so there's been the, this sort of divergence of preoccupations. But I think that that is misguided, that we really need to think about uh, what's desirable in the context of what's feasible and uh, take into account uh, the constraints and possibilities that might be offered uh, for thinking about policy rather than thinking about it in a vacuum. So just to give a couple of illustrations of policy without politics. Perhaps the most influential book of political economy written in the last couple of decades is, is uh, Piketty's uh, 
um, capital in the 21st century. This is the book in which he argues that uh, the reason for uh, increasing inequality is that returns to capital exceed returns to the other factors of production, and so wealth accumulates over time at the top. Um, economists debate his data and certain ways of measuring this, but that's not my concern here. Rather, what I wanted to just mention to you as examples of, of he's a brilliant economist, there's no question about that, but the things he says about politics are um, bereft of any s serious attention as to how they might be enacted. So, for example, in his book published in 2014, uh, in the penultimate chapter of that book, he calls for a progressive tax on global capital. And uh, at the beginning of that chapter, he does say, well, this might be a utopian idea, <laughs> but we should still put it out there for thinking about where we want to get to, and besides, it could inform more realistic proposals like a Europe-wide tax on capital. Um, now, you might say, well, in 2014, um, that wasn't, you know, might not have seemed a naive thing to say, as naive a thing to say as it is today, um, but uh, nonetheless, um, in 2018, he has pushed this idea further with uh, some other intellectuals in Europe. Um, publishing what they call a manifesto for the democratization of Europe, and you can find it and uh, peruse it at your leisure on their website. They're calling for the creation of a new European assembly um, that would essentially function as a European-wide parliament that would have powers to raise revenue and manage budgets, and uh, it would be the essential idea, the idea is that 80% of the legislators would be elected in the national elections, so when you vote for your MP in, in the UK or Austria, uh, they would also, uh, not only would they, they go to the British or Austrian parliament, they would also participate in this new European assembly. 80% of them would come from there, the others would come from the European parliament, uh, by proportional allocation. And uh, they portray this as an alternative to the current EU structures, which are so constrained by the treaty-based um, the treaty-based character of the European Union, which I lectured to you about some months ago. Um, but what do they ignore in proposing this? Uh, why is it why is it that the Lisbon Treaty ended up with a treaty-based system? It was because the more ambitious proposals envisaged at Maastricht were roundly rejected in referendums in Europe. And so they, they, they had to actually cancel uh, a number of the planned referendums because they, they saw the whole project of an ever closer union uh, heading for catastrophe. And so they retreated. The Lisbon Treaty is really a retreat back to the idea that, well, the EU is essentially a, a system of intergovernmental treaties in its ultimate legitimacy. They also argue that the, the purpose of this new European Parliament is to do things like reduce inequality within the member countries. But why, if the, if the member countries in their own parliaments can't reduce inequality, why would anyone think that going, sending them to a European Parliament would enable them to reduce inequality any more effectively? Um, so, and if you, if you go and read the website that they have there, um, uh, which I urge you to do, it's, quite, it's certainly an imaginative and interesting proposal in an, elect, in an, an intellectual sense. You will find the thing I said you should always be careful of, or should make you watch your wallet, the vast majority of it is written in the passive voice. The vast majority of it is about what should happen, uh, what should occur, uh, what needs to happen. Um, but of course, 
uh, we can talk until we're blue in the face about what needs to happen uh, without having anything to say about how to make it happen. What will be the political forces that are going to produce an outcome of this kind? And when you think back to the literature on the European Union, Tony Judd published his book in 20, 2006, post-war, when he warned. He said this, the problem of the European Union is that it's been an elite project from beginning until end, and as soon as it, it gets into any trouble, um, you, the po popular resentment of European-wide um, politics is going to uh, erupt, and it's not going to be pretty to see. He turned out to be right about that. Adam Tooze in Crash gives chapter and verse of the inability of the European uh, governing structures to come up po with policies that the populations in the constituent countries uh, will live with. Uh, and so nation you, you, the, the nationalism of the countries within the European Union is very powerful, and the idea that it's going to go away anytime soon, I think, is um, implausible. And I gave you a reason, if you think back uh, to my lecture, among the reasons is that the, the Europeans have contracted out their security to NATO over these past several decades, whereas in the American case, um, what built the sense of national uh, purpose uh, when we transitioned from the Confederacy to the Constitution was the creation of national defense and the funding of central of national defense and then the idea of a, that people would identify uh, with the national project rather than the, the, what we would might call the federal project rather than uh, state, the states. Uh, that was a transition that was set in motion by the centralization of uh, power over national security in the American system at the time of the Constitution. There's never been an analog of that, and so the idea of an ever closer union has r largely been a fantasy of elites for which popular support has never been built and indeed is less likely to be forthcoming today uh, than it has been uh, since any time uh, since uh, the, the financial crisis. So the idea that we can now create a new European Parliament that, as, as they argue, in cases of disagreement would actually uh, trump uh, the, the uh, decisions of um, the European Union, uh, who, which are constrained by the treaty-based character uh, of, uh, that strengthens national parliaments, I think is, 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 is an example of uh, policy without politics being ultimately empty. What about politics without policy? Well, we have examples of that, just to give one here. to fight for our country and to keep it, you know, true to serving its people. And when it doesn't do that, it's immoral not to stand up and say something. I'm here myself as a free individual to humanize the markets and to have true participatory democracy, bottom-up democracy, and to make Wall Street hear the sound of what democracy means. What kind of power? People power! Wall Street, it crashes and uh, you know, people starve, people lose their jobs, things like that. We're very angry at Wall Street. It's the heart of capitalism, American capitalism especially. That's why we're here today at Wall Street. There's no reason to not be peaceful. We just want to get a point across. We're just trying to let people know what's going on and why we're here for it. One in seven children in the United States suffer from hunger. At the same time, we're giving billions and almost a trillion to Wall Street just for bailouts. Something needs to change. We need an economy for the people and by the people, not by the rich and for the rich. I mean, and the government's doing the work for us. All they have to do is cut some more people's insurance, unemployment benefits, and it won't be a bunch of 20-year-old white college students out here, you know? What would make today a success? What kinds of changes would you like to see as a result of everyone demonstrating today? Okay. 
a success, it's already happening. They corral the ball, and that's pretty much a huge symbolic statement. So there you have it. Uh, these, uh, this is the uh, beginning of the Occupy Wall Street movement. It was um, a movement that was uh, famously uh, uninterested in articulating particular policies, in organizing itself behind any particular agenda, but rather its purpose uh, was to express this moral outrage uh, at the bailing out of the financial uh, crisis and the inability of the Obama administration uh, to do much else. Um, they were, to some extent, uh, triggered by the Arab Spring movement, which had gotten going that year, but um, they really didn't advocate any particular policies. And indeed, if you think about, uh, if you think about um, uh, the decision to occupy Wall Street, uh, it was, you know, unlike the, at least the Vietnam protesters went to Washington, uh, where something might be done about it, whereas here they, they went to New York and then spent the following fall uh, on many uh, town and village greens around the, around the country, um, but because they lacked organization or leadership or resources, uh, once the cold weather came, they soon faded away. Now, th this doesn't mean that they were irrelevant to American politics. They articulated a, a moral narrative that was, uh, had a certain kind of coherence to it, uh, a re, you might call it a reactive moral narrative, and I'm going to have some more to say about the importance of moral narratives in effective distributive politics later uh, this morning. But um, th they, but they had nothing else. They had nothing more than an, a moral narrative, and moral narratives on their own are not enough. So again, this is this is politics without policy. So my agenda today is to get us to start thinking about how we can think about how there can be effective policies in light of what we do know about politics. And one phrase uh, that this calls to mind is in um, one of John Rawls's less famous writings, uh, His Law of Peoples, it comes from, I believe, where he first used it. This is the idea of realistic utopianism. And so the, the, the thing about being a realist about politics, um, in the real politics sense of realist, is the danger of being a realist is it might prevent you from trying for, to, to do things that will change reality, right? Um, that you'll, you'll be so constrained by your one sense of the politics, what, what, you know, that politics is the art of the possible. You'll be so constrained by the, the notion of what's possible that you won't push for policies that might change what's possible, right? Um, so that, that um, I think we, we actually said in our book on the uh, death by a thousand cuts that uh, the real political creativity gets people to think that what, that what they had previously regarded as impossible is in fact possible, um, right? That, that's, you, you know, I, I, you, you want to use the buzzwords, you, you want to push the envelope, think outside the box. You, you've heard them all before. And if you're very constrained in your thinking about what's, what appears to be feasible in politics as we know it today, you will not push to change the, the boundaries of what uh, is, a, it is possible in politics today. And so you, you run the risk of being, if you like, um, captive of uh, the inability to think imaginatively about ways to change uh, what is possible. And so I like this phrase, realistic utopianism, in that uh, it conjures up the idea of trying to get to a better place, but thinking about the steps from here to there. You've got to think about how you're going to join the dots, how you're going to, in fact, get policies adopted that might uh, change the, the politics on the ground, which I think is conspicuously missing 
in the proposal for European Parliament uh, uh, that we just talked about. And so to, to make that case, what I'm going to do today, and then I'm going to use this framework in our remaining lectures, is talk about what I'm, I'm going to call building blocks of effective distributive politics. And uh, there's six of them, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each of them. And I will uh, start with coalitions. Very important in politics to think about coalitions. And the reason it's very important in politics to think about coalitions goes back to our discussion of the differences between the um, median voter story and the majority rule divided dollar game. Right? So just to remind you, the, the median voter story created the expectation that because the median voter is always below the mean voter, there would be downward redistribution of wealth because politicians in, in search of the median voter would um, advocate policies that the median voter would prefer. And um, that was the, expect the fear of 19th century liberals. It was the hope of Marx in his later years when he started talking about the parliamentary road to socialism, and it's embodied in the median voter theorem. The puzzle was that um, it doesn't happen in any kind of systematic way, and we thought one reason for that might be that there's another dimension, such as race, that people care about more, and we talked about Nixon's Southern strategy in connection with all that. But then we talked in s about the majority rule divide a dollar game where we saw even without a second dimension um, any distribution of income uh, can be upset by majority rule. All you need is three people and you're off to the races with uh, the potential. Right? So another way of putting it is that the, the median voter theorem assumes that all of these people are going to vote together. Um, but in fact, you might get a coalition between the rich and the poor uh, against the middle class, or you might get all kinds of coalitions. And that means that no, um, no distribution of income and wealth is uh, not potentially vulnerable to being upset by majority rule. And I, I, an example of this we spent some time on earlier in the course, was the campaign to repeal the estate tax, which was just about money. Um, it was just one divisible good, um, and so uh, that's clearly not the case that um, it's a, a second dimension or anything like that producing the instability. So coalitions are really important. You have to think about uh, what coalitions are going to support what it is that you're trying to achieve, and you've got to think about them um, both inside the legislature and outside of the legislature. So if you're thinking about um, how to actually get a bill enacted in Congress, you have to, first, you have to not only think about uh, you know, who, is, who is going to buy off who, who, what deals are going to be made to get this bill through Parliament or through Congress, you're going to have to think about um, building support out there in the country for it, because there are many, many things that politicians uh, are planning to consider. But uh, in the American case, for example, the rule of thumb is if your bill does not get into, into the top eight, which means it would be known as HR 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, 7 or 8, it's not, going to, it's not going to actually make it to the floor. It's not going to be voted on. How do you, how do you get a bill uh, up there? We saw, again, with the bill to repeal the estate tax, that it took building support outside of the Beltway, uh, not just inside of the Beltway, uh, to get many politicians to become co-sponsors of that bill and see it as in their interest to support it. So you have to think about coalitions inside the legislature and outside the legislature. If you think about the abolition of the slave trade, uh, 
again, um, people like this begins in, it's a story that begins in Britain, people like William Wilberforce build a coalition in the British Parliament of so-called dissenting Whigs, the dissenters, and just by chance, this is when, this is before the heyday of strong parties in Britain, they still had multi-member districts, so they had much weaker parties, uh, and it so happened that um, it behaved much more like a European system, and it so happened that the dissenting Whigs for about five consecutive elections uh, in the mid, uh, between the mid 1830s and the um, 1860s, the Whigs held the balance of power and were able, since the, they, the dissenters held the balance of power, and because they cared more about that than anything else, uh, they made it a condition of supporting governments, even Whig governments, even governments that um, supported other things that they wanted. Um, they, they cared so much about this that, that, they, uh, that they were able to put it through the legislature. But they also built support for it outside the legislature. They, uh, through um, various anti-slavery societies, uh, and indeed after William Wilberforce left Parliament, he spent the rest of his life pressing the cause outside of the legislature. So you really have to think about building support inside the legislature and outside. A second thing you have to do is not only think about enabling coalitions, but you have to think about the blocking coalitions. If you're going to try and enact uh, a policy, who's going to try and stop it? And what are they going to do? Um, because you, you know, your coalition is not going to prevail if there's an effective blocking coalition. Again, we saw in the repeal of the estate tax, uh, very clever use of enabling conditions and very good strategic anticipation of how to head off potential blocking coalitions. And so we saw, for example, um, they got uh, the Congressional Black Caucus to support um, repeal of the estate tax on the grounds that uh, it would protect small business and particularly in uh, African-American communities and they got people like Bob Johnson uh, to support it of uh, black entertainment television on the grounds that uh, the, the first generations of wealthy uh, um, African-Americans shouldn't have their um, shouldn't have their uh, save their, their accumulations taxed away they got the support of gay groups on the grounds that the estate tax discriminates against gay people. At that time, there was no provision for gay marriage. Of course, it was not the estate tax that discriminated against gay people. It was the law of marriage that discriminated against gay people, but it didn't matter. They got um, Frank Blethen, a liberal owner of the Seattle Times, to get uh, family-owned newspapers to support it because they were worried about the Gannett and other big multinational news organizations gobbling them up. They got, um, they got the farmers to support it uh, so that they could get it through the Senate. They got small business to support it so they could get it through the House. Very clever use uh, of all of these groups. And then when they thought about the uh, potential blocking coalitions, the uh, life insurance industry, uh, so estate planning life insurance, the nonprofits benefit from the tax deductions that people make in order to uh, protect themselves from uh, estate taxes, and they uh, thought about unions who generally fight, uh, and they came up with a separate strategy for managing uh, every one of these uh, potential blockers, and so they managed to thread the needle in that way. Um, if you think about, um, if you think about the uh, abolition of the slave trade, they very cleverly, in order to head off a uh, potential blocking coalition, avoided the question of slavery itself and began first with the abolition of the slave trade in the North Atlantic. And so here, uh, if you think about um, 
the different coalitional possibilities, they change greatly. Um, because if, you, if you're talking about abolishing the slave trade, it did not prevent uh, the, the cotton manuf manufacturers in uh, Manchester from getting cheap cotton that came from the American South. Um, it did not prevent um, the Americans supporting after 1808, uh, when it was possible to abolish the slave trade. In fact, uh, part of the reason you couldn't have enforced an abolition of the slave trade without the Americans, uh, and the reasons the Americans supported it um, are not very morally uh, appealing. Uh, there was a racist sense that they didn't want uh, a, a, a great increase in the uh, African American population it, of the U.S. and in the American South, it was essentially protectionist. They, there was a, dom a domestic slave trade that they were interested in protecting at the time. So uh, it was possible to put together a coalition of strange bedfellows, if you like, to get rid of the North Atlantic slave trade. Um, and they w left the battling of slavery itself to another day. Um, so again, it was possible to put together the coalition and head off potential blocking coalitions by thinking in those kinds of strategic ways. A third feature of thinking about coalitions is that it's hugely important to pay attention to business interests. This has always been important. When we talked about, uh, we talked about the New Deal, uh, while it is true, and I even showed you the I Welcome Their Hatred video that, uh, on the second New Deal that, that uh, Roosevelt ran on when he was running for re-election, uh, as my colleague Peter Swenson and others have documented, that most significant expansions in welfare states have come about with at least tacit and sometimes active support from business interests. And if you think that that was true then, uh, in the world we're living in today that I've described to you uh, over, the, uh, over the lectures in this course, when business interests are in a position of unparalleled uh, power uh, politically, if you're going to try to enact policies um, that affect business interests, you better think about how they're going to respond. Um, now, that doesn't mean you should necessarily kowtow to business interests, but you need to think about where, where, will they be in an enabling coalition? Will they be in a blocking coalition? Is it possible to divide business interests? Um, uh, so that uh, some business interests are working at cross purposes with other business interests. But in, in the, this point of the 21st century, the idea that in any capitalist democracy, anybody is going to uh, enact policies that, effective, that affect business interests in a serious way uh, without contending with business interests is a fantasy. It, it's not going to be possible, and so you have to think about uh, how business interests are going to be uh, a factor in whatever it is that you're trying to do or trying to forestall. Um, so for all of these reasons, some analytical, some uh, empirical, uh, you have to think about coalitions. Uh, the median voter is not going to be enough. Um, secondly, moral narratives. As I said uh, when we talked about Occupy Wall Street, moral narratives matter in politics. Um, why do they matter? One reason is implicit in what we've already talked about. The very fact that purely interest-based coalitions are inherently unstable, we know that from the majority rule divided all game, means that something else has got to hold them together. You can't, if, if all you're going to do is, is say, um, 
you'll get a, you know, you, 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 we, we'll, we'll make a deal where you get the biggest possible slice. Somebody else will come along and offer you a bigger slice. And so you have to, uh, you have to think about, well, what is it w that will get people to resist when that somebody comes along and tries to recruit you to a blocking coalition? Um, the story I told you when we did the estate tax class was that um, when the Democrats finally figured out what was going on, they came and tried to hive off the farmers. They said, we'll give an immediate, remember this? We'll give an immediate exemption to farmers. And they had a huge fight uh, during the uh, subsequent meetings of the repeal coalition because the farmers were actually being offered a better deal by the Democrats, namely permanent repeal. Um, than uh, the bill was going to give them, which was going to be this weird 10-year uh, repeal. Um, but they, they said things when you interviewed them. They, they sounded like you know, abortion activists. They said, how could I look at myself in the mirror? How could I tell my child that I had been bought off? This is a moral crusade. It's an unjust tax, and so on. Um, if you want another example, um, many years ago, I had a call from an academic colleague, um, a philosopher, who said um, they were starting a new party. It was going to be called the New Party. <laughs> and uh, would I support it? And I said, well, OK, well, what is the New Party all about? And they said, we want it to be a, an equivalent counterbalance on the left to what the moral majority is on the right. All right, this is the era of the moral majority, um, which the moral majority was sort of predecessor, if you like, uh, to the Tea Party. I said, well, good luck, uh, goodbye. I hope you do well with it. And of course, there's a reason why nobody here has heard of the new party, um, because being a counterbalance to the moral majority is not it's not a compelling moral narrative. The people in the moral majority believe in something. That's why they're there, right? They're willing to uh, internalize costs. They're willing to stay up. They're willing to go to meetings. They're willing to do something because they believe in the cause, right? And so the, the idea that you can have, um, that you can have a people join a coalition who don't actually believe in the cause uh, isn't going to be enough when um, people come along uh, trying to split your coalition. Uh, when George W. Bush in 2005 sought to privatize Social Security, I'll have more to say about that in, in a little while, but one of the things he ran into was he couldn't split the coalition. He tr they tried by saying the new system will not apply to people they, I think they tried 55, and then they tried 50, under the age of 55, under the age of 50, and they found that uh, public opinion among the elderly didn't move a millimeter. So what did this reflect? It reflected, um, it reflected the fact that elderly people didn't just care about Social Security for themselves, but for their children and grandchildren, and so they weren't sufficiently self-interested to be peeled off in that way. Uh, they were committed to the idea that this is going to be important to be there for future generations. Again, uh, they couldn't be bought off just on the basis of their self-interest. So an effective movement is almost certainly going to uh, require moral narratives that cause people uh, to resist being picked off by some blocking coalition and going to motivate them to do the work, uh, to, to show up at meetings, to do the leafleting, to do the, the, the donkey work of uh, moving a movement forward. Notice it need not be the same moral narrative for everybody. If you look again, go back to the case of the abolition of the slave trade, I keep coming back to the slave trade. It's a very interesting example because an economist if there had been neoclassical economists around, 
uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, they would have said it would be impossible to abolish the slave trade, the race to the bottom, the, all the usual reasons would have been given. So I think it's, it's a great example of realistic utopianism uh, that, that it was actually got done. Um, but if you look at the moral narratives, actually um, people didn't share the same moral narratives. People, if you look at, um, some, some, for some it was religious, a religious moral narrative. For people like uh, David Hume, it was a different moral narrative. Uh, there were moral narratives uh, related to driving down wages uh, in, in uh, in some countries. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the same moral narrative, but it has to be a moral narrative that will motivate people uh, and prevent them from being picked off. So a third feature of effective distributive politics, and this is hugely important uh, and in some ways very difficult uh, sometimes in practice to think about, and this is to pursue proximate goals. Um, so a, you, one way of thinking about a proximate goal is that it's, it's a, a way station to a better future that will uh, start you on a road to somewhere where you're going to end up uh, later at a better one. So getting rid of the slave trade is a, is a proximate goal on the way to getting rid of slavery. Of course, it didn't help in the US. They had a, a civil war about it, but it did help in the British Empire. They finally they abolished slavery in almost the whole of the empire by 1833, uh, including by paying 20 million pounds in compensation in various parts of the empire. And then they spent the next six decades uh, stamping it out, in, uh, including getting involved in an undeclared war in South America. But so pursue, pursue proximate goals, move, to use an American uh, analogy, move the ball down the field rather than uh, simply trying to throw Hail Mary passes every time. So why is this important? Um, one is that it's important for sustaining coalitions and motivating support. So. Um, if you have a proximate goal, that's something you can organize your coalition around, you can motivate people to uh, fight for and to achieve. So um, if, you, if you think about, uh, say, again, repeal of a particular tax, we've got to repeal the tax, we've got, you know, we, 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 um, we build the coalition, we have the meetings, we push the bill, and then you finally achieve it, you can say, we did it, right? You can get people to focus on, uh, you can, that can motivate them and it gets them to focus on the result. Or if you think about the Civil Rights Act, uh, which we spent some time on, the, the, the features of the Civil Rights Act that were, were um, most effectively adopted involved well-defined proximate goals, like getting rid of restrictive covenants. The more um, nebulous goals, such as reducing racial inequality or, or integrating uh, neighborhoods, much harder to achieve. Um, so proximate goals are important for moving, uh, you know, moving things along in the direction that you want to go, and for making sure that the best does not become the enemy of the good. A um, couple of weeks ago, we had Gidon Bromberg from Echo Peace here to give the, uh, the part of the lecture that I had not had time to give um, when I talked about when we did the Israel-Palestine case. And I, I think I saw some of you in, in his lecture, uh, which is uh, on fascinating topic of using economic interdependencies around climate to work to move the Israel-Palestine um, conflict in the direction of a resolution. And in particular, uh, the fact that the, the Jordan River is drying up uh, and the, the two million people in Gaza lack sufficient uh, energy 
to process their own sewage, um, partly because it's being denied by Israel, the energy, but uh, partly just the overwhelming demographic pressure, uh, has started causing a situation where in increasing amounts of sewage from Gaza being pumped into the Mediterranean, drifting up uh, and forcing desalination plants in Israel to shut down. It turns out that Jordan um, has the best available uh, sit geographical situation and technology at the moment for solar energy. And so EcoPeace has uh, come up with a, an ingenious plan whereby um, uh, solar energy that can, can, can produce power that will power up the, the uh, sewage plants in Gaza, which will in turn uh, save Israel money, and they've, they've lined the whole thing up so that the incentives work for everyone. And all of the governments know this, and uh, they've even created, a, um, they've raised capital for it, so there's private sector interest in doing this. And several, in several rounds of peace negotiations, um, this, this solving this water problem in this way, which would actually integrate the Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian economies much more and produce co-dependencies has come up, but it's treated as one of the final status issues. And so the final status issues are these difficult questions to be resolved later, something that was never allowed to derail the South African negotiations. And so, uh, Gidon made the case that uh, it would be much better to solve the water issue now, and he pointed out that every, every Middle East negotiator that had tried to get a settlement from Clinton to Kerry um, and others in between subsequently had said we should have, we should have dealt with the water issue. Uh, so this is an example. He, uh, again, the, we, we videotaped that lecture, but I strongly urge you to go and see it, of, a, of an example where um, it would be much better not to let uh, the best be the enemy of the good, but use, uh, use the water issue and res resolution of the water issue uh, to take it off the table and move the, the, th the three countries into a situation where they would be um, more likely to cooperate on other matters in the future. But there are hard cases. There are really difficult cases in thinking about um, proximate goals. And the hard cases are where if you pursue a proximate goal, it might make it, instead of being a way station to the future, it might actually make the future more difficult uh, to achieve. So, so think, about, um, think about Medicare and Social Security. Social Security, we've, we discussed earlier, was put in place in 1935, and in order to get it through Congress, uh, FDR had to exclude domestic and ag agricultural workers because uh, not to do so would have, would have broken up his coalition of Southern Democrats who controlled the committees. And so uh, that was done later. It was expanded to cover those workers later. That's, you know, it's not, it wasn't great for the people at the time, but um, you could say, well, you know, you, get, you take what you can get and you build, you expand it later. Um, Medicare is a harder case because Medicare, put in place in 1965, part of the Great Society by Lyndon Johnson, creates the world we live in today where it's much more difficult to create universal health care because the one group that you would want in your coalition has no reason to be there, namely the elderly. The elderly, uh, they vote, uh, they give, they, they're politically active, but they already have medic, they already have universal health care, and indeed, um, if you were going to go to uh, any of the current plans being proposed, which are being underpriced for Medicare for all, there would be a reasonable fear that Medicare benefits were going to be diluted for the people who already have them. 
So that becomes a much harder judgment. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't have gone for Medicare for 65 year olds in 1965. It's just a harder call. It's a harder case, right? Because you're, you're creating um, a potential to split the coalition that you're going to need to expand it later because Medicare funding is seen as more of a, a zero sum system of funding than the way Social Security is funded, about which I will say more in a minute. Sometimes it should be said that this is shooting in the dark. When uh, Bush passed his 2001 tax cut that included the, um, that included the, the estate tax repeal, it, it was done through budget reconciliation and it was going to go away ten years later. Actually nobody had any idea what that would mean. You know, and, and you couldn't use the inertia of the system because the inertia was going to have it go away. It was going to be repealed back to the 2001 law uh, if nothing was done. So they, they were just gambling and as it turned out uh, the Obama administration made almost all of it permanent as we saw. But so, so proximate goals, really important, but you need to always recognize that pursuing a proximate goal may not be um, good in the long run. And so in that sense, uh, as I said, I'm not, I think it'd be hard to make the case that if it was Medicare for 65 year olds or nothing, it would have been better to have taken nothing, um, but it's a hard political call. Entrenching gains, very important to entrench gains for the long run because otherwise they can be undone. The classic example of this, of course, is Reconstruction. Uh, the gains that were brought about uh, as a result of the Civil War, yes, we got the abolition of slavery, but the, then we got you know, the, the 15th, uh, 14th and 15th Amendments and uh, the uh, extension of the franchise, all of which was later undone because uh, the, the North was not sufficiently committed uh, to, to entrenching those changes. Um, if you want an example of the, what I'm calling here the gold standard of entrenchment, it's the way that Social Security was funded. So what FDR did uh, was quite ingenious. They put in, put in the system where you know, it's, it's a savings plan, the idea is you work for your lifetime, you pay in and then when you retire come, you get it out. Uh, but that's not the way it's financed. It's not the way it's financed because they wanted to start paying out immediately. And of course the first generation of workers in 1935 hadn't paid in. They would start paying out in 1937. Those people had not paid in. And so in reality the current generation of workers funds the current generation of retirees. And when people say there's an IOU in the Social Security Trust Fund, that's what they mean. Right? Now FDR did that for two reasons. One was to build the coalition. He wanted, wanted everybody to support it at the time, so he wanted uh, existing workers who hadn't paid in to support it. Of course, if you're going you're gonna to get it, you know, people about to retire are going to get it, they're going to support the coalition. But he also wanted to make it impossible or very difficult to undo, right? As he said, I'm going to fund this, he said, I'm going to set this up in a way so that no damn fool politician uh, can ever undo it. And so in 2005 when George W. Bush tried to undo it, he ran into the reality that you know, what they wanted to do was create private accounts. The, you, instead of the money going to the government, this is two years before the financial crisis, it would have been pretty ugly politics uh, if they'd gotten, gotten away with it, but uh, instead of the money going into, the, into Social Security, it, it would be just like an IRA or like, a, you know, uh, like we, all, we all have, it would, it would be uh, going to a, an account that would, you would privately manage account. Um, but the problem was to do this, they would have had to fund both systems for an entire cohort, right? Because there, there's no money in the trust fund, right? And so this in effect is what made the, the financing of Social Security, apart from its popularity, made it uh, 
bulletproof. So very, very clever system of entrenching the program in a way that would make it extremely costly, and as it turned out, eventually the Bush people gave up. Um, but the most important thing, and this, this uh, should be evident to you from my earlier lecture on bundling, is that the, the way in which you um, build protection for a policy is to build support for it and get one of the major parties to bundle it into their major party platform. So what protected the Civil Rights Act is it's bundled into the Democratic platform. What failed to protect Reconstruction is it was not bundled into the things that Northern Republicans cared about. Um, and of course, if you can get it bundled into the platforms of both parties, such as Social Security effectively is, uh, even better. Um, so entrenched proximate gains uh, for the long term. Resources matter. Resources matter um, in two senses. Um, res resources for funding the effort. Uh, if you look at something like the estate tax repeal coalition, um, wealthy, um, wealthy individuals put up money to fund the organizing effort to get that done. Um, and we, we give chapter and verse of that in, in our book. Uh, they paid for the meetings, they paid for the resources uh, to lobby, uh, and so on. And indeed, the whole uh, rise of uh, neoliberalism was funded uh, not through campaign contributions, but spending on think tanks and uh, other areas. So funding efforts, and then funding the policy. Um, so what was so brilliant about Social Security was it was immediately funded by uh, existing workers. So again, you have to think about the resources, whereas, again, go back to Occupy Wall Street that we began with, one of the reasons um, the mayors of most cities just ignored them was that they knew winter would come, they would have no money, they would have no resources, and they would you know, pack up and go, go back to wherever they came from. So again, they hadn't any uh, resources. And then finally, leadership matters. Leadership matters partly because uh, all coalitions are unstable. You need people to articulate. Uh, you need people to articulate the moral narratives, to do the work, uh, to keep people together. Um, again, if you think about the Civil Rights Act, the Kennedy people, they sent civil rights legislation to Capitol Hill on, uh, in 1963. Uh, they had almost no experience with Congress and uh, it soon got bottled up in the committees. And um, it wasn't until Lyndon Johnson, who had been the master of the Senate, this is all told chapter and verse in volume four of Caro's um, uh, four volume work on Lyndon Johnson, but um, Johnson understood, he's widely recognized as one of the most effective legislative politicians of the, of the 20th century, and it was he who figured out how to do, to do the leadership on the Hill to get that, uh, that enacted. Um, so you need leadership in the legislature, you need grassroots leadership, you need roots, uh, you need to mobilize support for policies or it, they're not going to get enacted, and of course you need what's sometimes referred to by consultant as grass tops legis, uh, leadership. You need those Frank Blethens and you need those um, um, Bob Johnsons um, to, to push for support, uh, if you like, uh, to articulate, to act as kind of brokers between grassroots support uh, and support in uh, the legislature. But just to finish, Effective politics is not enough. Those six elements are not enough. Uh, if you go back through the story I told you about home ownership, uh, 
there, were great, there was a great coalition to do it that included politicians from both parties, it included the lobbyists from Fannie and Freddie, it, it included people who were going to make money out of securitization. They had not one but two moral narratives, the, the American dream of home ownership on the one hand and then racial inclusion on the other. So they had two moral narratives. They had great proximate goals. They could articulate uh, how many more homes should be owned by minority homeowners by benchmark dates. So they had proximate goal after proximate goal. They entrenched the gains indeed. One of the tragedies of it was that it was impossible to unwind when it would have been in the interests of the minority homeowners to unwind it in the ways that Gina Coppolis was proposing. So it, it became a kind of uh, pathological, pathologically entrenched. The resources were brilliantly generated by the securitization, which created a steady cycle of liquidity um, to produce more of the activity until the music stopped to use Blinder's line. And then there was leadership. There was leadership from both, uh, both political parties, uh, there was uh, leadership in the country, and there was uh, plenty of support from business leaders who saw that there was money to be made. So building blocks uh, of effective distributive politics are important, but they're not a substitute for good policy, and you can indeed have bad policy that uh, meets all six uh, of these uh, criteria, and that would be the poster child for that. So next we're going to look at good policies that can be enacted by paying attention to these six building, policy, uh, building blocks, and that's what we'll start with on Thursday. <laughs>